wrote it wrong so let me do that for you that if I write um, 10101101 this is 1 2 4 8 16 32 64 and 128 so if you add the bits which are on with their placeholders so instead of getting 109 you should be getting one uh, 173 here okay so that's a correction in lecture 10 so uh, you can correct it over there okay now coming to next uh, part of that thing of uh, I in the passing of that lecture I said that uh, we do not use one's complement to represent the negative numbers. Uh, and we actually use two's complement. Uh, reason is that uh, in two's complement, uh, we do not have the problem of obviously one's complement. Let's see what the problem of one complement is. Actually, in one's complement, you have to keep in mind that uh, it was used uh, in the very old computers once, I mean, a long time ago, but not anymore. Uh, the problem there are actually two problems with one complement the first problem is that how do you represent a zero uh, which is in decimal in binary number so if you have a a bind if you have a decimal zero and let's say you have an eight bit number so you would naturally represent zero with i mean with eight binary bits all set to zero so if i take the ones complement and i say that the ones complement represent a negative number that means that if I take one's complement, that means I'm inverting all the bits. So it will become all ones and all ones. So we can say that this is actually minus zero. I mean, minus zero and plus zero are exactly the same. So now we have two representations of zeros in one's complement. Actually, one's complement uh, initially was that if you want to represent a negative number, just invert all the bits and call that, call that a negative number. Uh, but it has a problem of this thing. So we do not use one's complement because we have two representation of zeros. Because if you take one's complement again of this thing, that means you just uh, invert all the bits and you get this thing. So we have uh, essentially two representation of plus zero and minus zero. However, in in the uh, let's say if we have a two's complement uh, method in two's complement we um, actually do not um, add the carry bit actually that's uh, another thing in one's complement we have to keep in mind that we have to keep track of carry bit and add that again but in two's complement we do not uh, use that carry bit we just discard it so let's say if we are using two's complement we can represent zero in binary as four zero oh, sorry eight zeros if you have an eight bit number now if i take the two's complement two's complement is uh, the process which you have seen in the recorded lecture was take one's complement that is invert all the zero bits and then add one so if I invert all the bits, so I get one, 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 and one, 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 one. And then and I add one to it. So one plus one is in binary, one plus one is one zero, as as is in uh, uh because uh one plus one is actually two, two in binary is one zero. So we have zero here and we add zero here, carry here, zero here, carry here, and so on and so forth. So in the last bit, carry here, and this carry is actually discarded carry is discarded. So in two's complement, we only have just one representation of zero, which is essentially all zeros. And another, um, uh, that means that in one's complement, we have to actually, if there is some carry uh, after that, and one's complement, we have to add that again, it's not discarded. Uh, but in two's complement, you can just ignore the carry and discard it. So two's complement is actually much easier. There is no problem with uh, the two representation of zero. There is just one representation of zero. Uh, we just discard the carry bit. And uh, subtraction becomes addition. That means if you want to add two numbers, you just add them as they are. Uh, but if you want to subtract two numbers, let's say you want to do uh, 7 minus uh, 4. So what you do is you take the two's complement of 4. So that will become minus 4. And then you to add the two's complement of 4 with 7. You are essentially doing 7 minus 4. That means that uh, subtraction. Subtraction becomes addition. So coming to if there are any comments. No, not any. OK. And multiplication is actually repeated addition. So let's say you want to multiply 2 multiply by 4. That means you have to add to uh, uh, four times. So that's uh, not a problem anymore. Uh, that that would have been done with simple uh, binary numbers as we have done before. And division is actually repeated subtraction. Let's say you want to divide uh, eight divided by two, and that means that how many times you can subtract two from eight. So you can subtract two from eight uh, four times, and then you, had a, you end up with the remainder of zero. So actually, div uh, division 
is actually repeated subtraction. And uh, we know that subtraction is behind the scene addition if we are doing two's complement, because instead of my uh, subtracting two numbers, we are adding the two numbers. I mean, one of the number has uh, his two's complement taken to convert it into a uh, negative number. So that means that the basic basic medical, mathematical operations become just addition. And uh, we can just do, I mean, pretty much all the operations of uh, maths using just addition and something known as shifting. Uh, you just shift the numbers one bit at a time, either to the left or to the right. It depends on what process you are using. But uh, just by addition and shifting, we can construct pretty much all the um, mathematical operations there are there. OK, so range calculation we did for unsigned numbers. The range calculation formula was really simple. That's uh, 2 to the power n. I mean, let's say n is the number of bits. n is a uh, number of bits. The number of bits was uh, 2 to the power n minus 1. So the range of the unsigned numbers, it went from 0 to 2 to the power n minus 1. So let's say if we have a 16-bit number. The 16-bit number will go from 0 to 655. Three five. I mean, since from zero to six five 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 three five, there are six five five uh, three six numbers. Since we are counting from zero, that's why we are going all the way to six five five three five. Since we are counting from zero, that's why we are taking minus one over here. So the range goes from zero to two to the power n minus one. The actual numbers or the actual combination in a sixteen bit number uh, from all zeros to all one is actually six five five three six. So if you have a unsigned number, unsigned number will go from zero to the maximum possible value. And if you have a signed number, the signed number formula was um, minus two to the power n minus one and all the way to two to the power n minus one. Uh, minus one. So that means that if you have an eight bit number, the eight bit number you will put two to the power uh, seven and all the way to two to the power seven minus one, it will go from minus 128 to plus 127. And then we are talking about two's complement representation of sine numbers. And uh, they have one more uh, from minus 128 to plus 127. And I've explained that in detail in the uh, recorded lectures. So with that in mind, if we know the range of the numbers, we can come back to uh, we can come back to uh, the calculation of how much there is an addressable memory. You might have heard that uh, if you are working with microcontrollers, you might have heard that it's an 8-bit microcontroller or a 16-bit or a 32-bit microcontroller. Or you might have heard that our computers are 64-bit and our mobile phone operating systems are also 64-bits. So now we can understand that how much memory is there. Actually, when we are talking about, let's say, if you have an 8-bit computer, uh, behind the scene, it means actually two things. Uh, what is a, a maximum? Uh, word length or what's the maximum number it can work with. Obviously, if with an 8-bit computer, you can work with larger numbers. Actually, it's actually possible. There are programming workarounds if you want to do that. But uh, actually, uh, it means that how many address lines are there in a computer? What we mean by address lines is that computer has a central processing unit. It has its own cache memory to uh, store the frequently accessed variable and instructions. And it has also has a random access memory to load the programs and the data contained in therein and uh, on the RAM. And that's, that's the random access memory. That means it can access the uh, memory equations randomly, not sequentially. So that means that if you have, let's take a very simple example. Let's say if we have a computer and take a very simple example. Let's say it is a one bit computer, even though that's that not, might not be much useful. But uh, starting with a one bit computer and it is an address line and it is a wire which says uh, which can either have a zero volt or maybe five volt or we can have a high voltage or a sorry or low voltage or a high voltage. That means in binary terms, it can either have zero or one on this wire. So we are calling that this wire an address bus. So that means that this address bus can either access the memory zero or memory one. So if you have a one bit memory or if I, you have a one bit address line, that means you can access only two memory locations. So let's say if you have a two address lines two address lines. So two address lines means we have two wires. And each of these wires can have either 0 or 1. So there are actually four possible combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 
one one zero and one one so that means and i mean there is some extra circuit uh, we call that a multiplexer you might have you might you will see in your logic design course but let's say we it is possible but just by two using just two address lines we can access four memory spaces four bytes of memory actually the first has an address of zero zero the second one has the zero one and it has one zero and it has the fourth one has one one that means that with two address lines our address size is two bits and using two bits address we can access four memory locations depending on what uh, logic level or what binary number is on these address lines i mean they will carry voltages and after that i mean we would be using something known as a multiplexer and uh, and that multiplexer i mean depending on what uh, the uh, depending on what the input is it will just it will just access any one of these uh, memory locations even though it can access all of them but depending on what the input is it can just access one of them i'm not going into the detail of the multiplexer but the for us only need only thing we need to understand is that if we have uh, two address lines we can access four memory locations now going back to going to four let's say if we have four address lines so we can say that we have four wires in our address bus by address bus this word address bus or address bus width we say that our address bus width is four uh, bits long or four bits wide and uh, it can have all the way from 0000 to 1111 it can have 16 possible uh, addresses and each possible address can uh, be assigned to 16 bytes so we have uh, 16 memory locations going from all the way to 15 or in binary 0000 to 1111 or in hexadecimal 0 to f so we have 16 possible uh, 16 possible uh, addresses and each address can access one of those 16 bytes so if we have a four bit computer that means the address bus width is four bits or four address lines so now you can understand that if we have an eight bit computer by eight bit computer we mean that the address width is eight lines or eight uh, wires one two three four five six seven eight so we can have all zeros in these wires or we can have i mean all the way to all ones in these wires so from all zeros to all ones we can have from 0 to 255 that means that if we have an 8 bit computer an 8 bit computer can access 256 memory locations 8 bit computer can access 256 memory location now this 256 is going to be important later on so keep in mind that if we have all zeros it can access the first memory location and if we have all ones we can access the last 256th memory location uh, which is addressed by this uh, address i mean this 255 or in binary we oh, sorry in hexadecimal we can say ff now if we have a 16-bit computer or I think we do have 10-bit computers for 10-bit computers you can see the pattern that we can have 2 to the power 10 or 1024 uh, addressable locations sorry for writing uh, 1024 addressable locations or we can just say in computer terms we have 1k of memory 1k of memory now if we have a 16-bit computer 16-bit computer means we have 16 lines in our address bus and we can access 2 to the power 16 equals to 65536 or you might have seen this word as 64k this thing is written as 64k behind the scene it means this thing so i mean this is a form of writing it actual meaning is 65536 so that means that if you have a 16-bit computer if we have a 16-bit microcontroller it can access 65536 memory locations and i am just um, I'm just uh, assuming that the all the memory is uh, located in one memory chip. If you have two memory chips, let's say if we have one memory chip and we have another memory chip, that means that if we have 16-bit memory, and it might take some time to draw it. So we have eight lines and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have 16 lines of, uh, or 16 lanes of address bus or 16 bit wide address bus. So that means that if we have two chips which can store our random access memory, we must assign one line to chip select. That means that either we can select chip zero or we can select chip one. So that means if we, the remaining lines are just 15, 
where 15 lines so that means the maximum addressable memory would uh, go from 2 to the power 15 and 2 to the power 15 is 2 to the power 15 is 3 to 7 6 eight. so that means that uh, if we have two chips so that means we can only access 3 to 7 6 8 or 32k of memory uh, that means that this chip can have 16k of memory this chip can have 16k of memory and in total we can have just 32k of memory however if we have one chip let's say instead of two chips we have one chip and it depends on the motherboard uh, on which the processor is implanted and the i mean what the motherboard facilities are so if we have just one chip it can have 64k of memory because we do not need a chip select line over here because we know that there's just one chip so we can use all the 16 lines for uh, the addresses of the uh, memory so that means that we have uh, like 65536 bytes in this memory and each byte and this is important each byte will have a 16 bit address each byte will have a 16 bit address so that means it will go from 0000, 000, 000 so all the way to f f f f and each byte each byte is eight bits and we know that and each byte would have a 16 bit address because we are using those 16 lines to access just one byte of the memory at a time okay so i will be coming back to the questions in a moment now coming back to um, coming back to uh, if we have a 32 bit computer so by 32 bit computer that means that we can have 2 to the power 32 uh, maximum memory so if we can go to 2 to the power 32 we will get uh, four gigabytes of memory. And you might have heard the number that if you have a 32-bit computer, you might, if in old computers actually, the maximum addressable memory is uh, 32, sorry, four gigabytes. So, I mean, I mean, that's the, I mean, if you have just one chip for the whole memory, uh, but if you have like two chips for memory, two random access memory chips, or I mean, whatever you call them. So that means one line is used for the chip select and the maximum addressable memory would be to the power 31 that would be two gigabytes of memory so i mean theoretically it's possible to have like four gigabytes of memory uh, if you have just one chip uh, actually it's some other thing which i have not discussed it's actually possible to access the whole memory space uh, but that's for just the starters so now if, if we have a 64-bit computer for 64-bit computer we have this much addressable memory that's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve uh 13 14 15 16 17 18 that's like 18 billion gigabytes possibly so that's essentially i mean a very really large memory space is available for 64-bit computers and essentially all of our computers like core i3 i5 i7 i9 and our uh, snapdragon processors and the uh, all the processor used by the Apple and all things, all are 64-bit essentially computers and they can have a really large memory uh, addressable. It's not necessary for the manufacturer to uh, provide um, this much memory. I mean, it depends on uh, the motherboard on how many uh, random access memory uh, slots are there. Let's say if you have a motherboard of just with two slots, I mean, you might be limited to maybe eight or 16 gigabytes depending on the motherboard limitations. Uh, but in big computers, we might have eight or maybe 16 random access memory memory slots. So uh, there you can use, or there you can have uh, like 128 or maybe one terabytes of random access memory uh, depending on the motherboard. So, I mean, it, now we are talking about how much addressable memory is there so obviously 64-bit computers can have a really 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 large addressable memory space available 32-bit uh, computers have four gigabytes of memory available uh, if you have an 8-bit computer you can address just 256 memory locations if you have a 16-bit computer you have the 64k of memory available so if you look at the processor specifications you will see that it's a 32-bit processor it might have a 64-bit processor it might be an 8-bit processor so that uh, limits the amount of addressable memory depending on the uh, address bus width okay so the next topic which we covered and which is kind of an interesting topic is that we need to watch out for overflow errors by overflow errors is
by overflow errors we mean that uh, we are storing a result or storing a number and that number simply does not have the space to store that uh, sorry that variable is does not have the space to store a very large number and we have seen that in our recorded lecture that if you try to store a number and the variable simply does not have the space it will cycle around to the zero and maybe to the negative value depending on its assigned number on an unsigned number so that means that we for variables as well as the variables which store the results of mathematical operations we need to watch out that where are we storing the numbers so let's say if you are using a short number by uh, let's take a result of uh, short number uh, short is i think four byte four byte yes is it four bytes yes so let's say if you take an unsigned short number so unsigned short number it will go from uh, 0 to 65535 i think we have 65535 or 65535 is let me check the limits um the unsigned short i think it was 32 bits so it will go from 0 to 4 billion okay so let's say let, let, let's take an example first and then we will come back to uh, our um, this number or whatever the line length of it i mean i don't remember how many bits it takes so you need to check the limits sort of header file but let's say if you have a 8 bit number let's say very i mean let's ignore this thing let's say if you have an 8 bit number and it's an unsigned number so that if you have an 8 bit variable uh, unsigned and it can store an 8 bit unsigned number and the range will go from 0 to uh, 255 okay so let's say we have an unsigned variable I'm, I'm not saying that and, and actually in C++ the smallest size is actually a corrector if you treat it as an integer it will be an 8 by it will be a 1 byte number so if you have an 8 bit number I'm not saying what type it is just uh, try to understand the concept and I store the value to 55 in it okay and let's call it variable A and I have another 8 bit number let's call it variable B and I store it with another 255 now, if I have another variable C and I want to store the product of A into B, and C also has the size of 8 bits, that means that C cannot store the result of this mathematical uh, multiplication. Reason is if you multiply 255 into 255, to, uh, 255 into 255, you will see you will get 65025. That means that to store the result of uh, 8 bit multiplication and we are talking about the worst case scenario that means that the 8 bit number has the maximum possible value to store the number instead of using 8 bit for the result you have to use let me take the log of this thing log 2 of this thing divided by uh, log 2 of this thing so you will get 15.988 that means that to store the result of 2 store the result of multiplication of two 8-bit numbers you need 16 bits that's the important thing so the worst case scenario is actually a multiplication of two numbers so if you want to store the result of that multiplication you have to keep in mind that you need to store the result in obviously a larger variable and the size of the larger variable must at least b n plus m bits n is the number of bits for first operand or the a and and uh, m is the number of bits for the second operand which is what we call b so if you are multiplying two 8 bit numbers you keep you have to keep in mind that the result must be stored in a 16 bit number so you can type cast it to a larger uh, variable size or you have to keep in mind that or let's say if you are multiplying two 16 bit numbers it is necessary that the result must be stored in a 32 bit number so it is important so I mean in the programs what I did was I declared a variable integer a B and C and I was taking the input from the user I was typing the input myself actually I can I, I mean as far as the uh, logical correction is concerned we cannot store the result of these two multiplicants or if I'm multiplying a with B I cannot store in within C because C is the same size of a and B so what I need to do is because integer was four bytes and long long integer i think long integer was also four bytes if i remember it correctly so i need to declare a variable long long integer c so that i can store the result of a into b into c 
because uh, let's say we are taking the input from the user and the user types the maximum possible value so that maximum possible value uh, for both numbers that would be stored in the number which cannot store that maximum possible value because uh, this thing is a 32 bit this thing is a 32 bit and this thing was a 32 bit so if you are multiplying two 32 bit numbers we need to store the result in a 64 bit number just to keep just to uh, be prepared for the any eventuality that the user inputs a very large number so uh, obviously uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, we need to multiply uh, two numbers and restore the result in a very large number in the programming examples what i was doing was this thing uh, because i did not want to complicate matters uh, i mean further so that's why i was declaring those variables as integer abc but in real life if you want to program it always store the result uh, in a variable which is twice the size of the operands okay so for let's say if a and b are of 32 bits each you store the result in a 64 bit number if a and b are 64 bits each store the result in a 128 bit number uh, depends on you do that uh, let me check out if there is a 128 bit type defined over there i don't i'm not so sure about it okay so watch out for uh, overflow errors i mean overflow errors happen when you try to store a big value bigger than the space there is so i'm going to some case studies from the book so to yes that's right Hassan Ahmed. Achha, ab, uh, sorry coming back to the book there's a book known as humble pie uh, i will just upload it to this uh, our it's a very readable book uh, i would suggest you read it or at least read chapter six and chapters there was another chapter chapter 13 in chapter six let me discuss the examples and uh, from this book it's a very readable book um, you can just read it sometime so this is the example of an overflow error not exactly an overflow error but there was this uh, famous case of Ariane 5 rocket it exploded because they were trying to fit 64 bit number in a 16 bit space and that crashed uh, both primary and the backup computers so this example is given in let me get back here oh sorry about it this example is given not in chapter six but in chapter uh, 13 actually so uh, coming to coming to the next example it is uh, there is another i mean kind of funny example i'm not so sure whether you have seen this game but in 1991 civilization computer game there was this funny example you might have heard of some person named gandhi he was i mean we have Qaidiyatam here in pakistan and they have gandhi mahatma gandhi in india um there we have a it's a very fun example actually uh, what happened was in this game civilization game you just uh, revisit history and they have uh, I mean what they noticed was that Gandhi was known to be a peace loving person and uh, but as the civilizations developed he was nuking every other nation there was a mistake in the computer code the game designers uh, deliberately given Gandhi the lowest non-zero aggression rating possible a score of one so as the civilizations develop uh, the every leader had their aggr aggression rating uh, subtracted by two. So for Gandhi, starting from one, this calculation played out as one minus two equals to 255. Again, overflow error, uh, certainly setting him into maximum ag aggression. So even though this error has been fixed, later versions of the game kept Gandhi as the most new happy leader as the tradition. Okay, so this is a, another problem for this overflow kind of thing. And you might have noticed if you have a really large WhatsApp group in previous versions that WhatsApp group limit was set to 56. Now you know that where 256 came from. Uh, it came from an 8-bit number. So I think this WhatsApp group limit has been uh, extended to, I think, 10,000. Uh, if you just send the group invite to the contacts and not add them as such. So I'm not so sure. I mean, I do not have any WhatsApp group of 256 members, actually. So it's actually, I think the larger, I, largest I have is like 200 members. OK, uh, trains in Switzerland, they cannot have 256 axles uh, as per their code. Uh, reason is that they have some kind of a detector to detect the, uh, they have some kind of a detector to detect that some train has crossed that and, uh, 
six-way strain regulation that can I mean a train can have a maximum of 236 axles uh, because it will um, I mean because they are storing uh, the number of axles passed on a track by a detector in an 8-bit number so if if a train has uh, more than 256 axles it will just reset it back to zero and uh, it will have a result of some kind of a phantom train it might not detect those errors and there is a pacman example of an 8-bit i mean if you go to level 256 you have some weird looking code here the actual reasoning behind this thing is actually given in the uh, book. I'm not going to the details, but it's an interesting read. Uh, the f deadly code error was uh, this example. I mean, this was in a radiation machine in which the loop count was set to 256. I mean, I mean loop count. I mean, how many times a, a certain code has run as a safety check? It was uh, stored in an 8-bit number. So that means it will go from the 0 to 255, and then it will reset it back to 0. And that means that if the machine is safe, the code was set to be 0. Um, but if the machine, I mean, this here is mentioned over here, that everything was safe, the code was set to 0. And it is also possible that the machine has run so many times that it's the code was set to 0, uh, I mean, after like 256 try. So one patient actually died there because instead of uh, getting the uh, this because instead of uh, checking for the safety, the operator assumed since the code was set to zero because this machine has run mess like so many times, um, the machine the the patient actually received um, like eighty six radiations uh, eighty six doses of radiation. We actually received like uh, 8,000 to 10,000 doses of radiation, and obviously he did not survive there. So it can have some deadly consequences for uh, overflow errors. OK, Pac-Man, Therac machine, further reading. Further reading, for further reading, I would suggest that you check out the buffer overflow with hacking. And here we do that uh, we deliberately cause the memory locations to overflow and so that the program crashes. And it is actually possible that the program, which is crashing some other program, the hacker program, can actually now run with the uh, system level privileges so that it can have a administrator level access to the computer. So the buffer overflow happens all the time. There are some safe software practices to prevent that. Uh, the, our code needs to be on the safe side. We need to check the variables. We need to check the data coming in. We need to check the results which are going into these variables. Obviously, it will make the program development quite slow, but it will make our code safe uh, because the applications we are running, they are running in a sandbox provided by the world operating system. And that operating system, and if our application is, uh, communicating with outside world, it is actually possible to take in the data and cause the buffer overflow error in which some of the memory space allocated by the operating system uh, is overflowed or uh, some larger numbers are stored and played by crashing the program. And while crashing the program, two things can happen. If you relaunch the program or if you have some other malicious code running on the computer, it can take over the privileged memory space and take over the control of the computer. And the thing is, it can just do memory sidestepping and it can read the nearby memory locations uh, so that further operating system features can be unlocked for the malicious code. So to check out this thing, and you can just Google search buffer overflow and hacking, you can have, and you can read lots of articles in uh, on this topic. OK, so coming to questions, sir, I'm having, please send the book and go. Yes, I will send it, inshallah. Um, how can I get the latest update regarding the mids assignment? OK, for mids and assignments, you will go to the class thing, and it will be actually the university administration has not yet decided how to conduct the mid exams. Um, actually, the mid exams, the course has been decided. I will post it here on this class web page. You can see that, I mean, where we are posting the comments and everything. Uh, I will post the updates over here. But we haven't received that how the mid exam, mid exam would be conducted. Either they would be conducted in the university, or if they are conducted online, we will let you know that how, I mean, they will be obviously announced on the university website, as well as on these class pages. So there, I mean, all the updates coming up, all the books coming up, 
are on this class web page. Uh, if you want to prepare for your exams, uh, I would suggest that you do the detail in detail problems. End of chapter, chapter one, two, maybe three, uh, not three, chapter one, two only. And in the next uh, one or two weeks, we will be doing the if, else, and switch statement. So the last topic before the mids would be uh, in the previous class, I said I will be doing loops, but not anymore. Uh, the last topic before the mids or the mids labels will be having the variables and making simple programs as well as the if else statement as well as the switch statement we will be covering that in live lecture number six inshallah and that will be the last topic of uh, lecture number six i think lecture number four or five yes it will be in lecture number six inshallah and we will be uh, covering i mean the case or the switch case statement is the last topic in which we are taking the input from the user and we are deciding on what next to do so just uh, don't go anywhere i'm just going to take the attendance So it is, let me save that attendance first. Okay, let me check the attendance. Uh, uh, this one going, okay, attendance has been taken. Okay. Now, if anybody wants to ask any question, he can, he or she can ask that question. Or, um, can you please add a list of topics covered in one week lecture? Uh, yeah, list of topics are given. Um, list of topics. List of topics uh, is actually given the summary of those lectures. Um, I can provide. Yeah, I have the list of topics written on my notebook. Uh, I can type it up and send it out to you. Okay, I will just do it, inshallah, during this week. Uh, please provide a PDF of all programs. Uh, actually, I, in some of the programs, I actually overwrote whatever the code was there. So uh, it's actually not possible to provide the PDF of all the programs. I mean, the programs are really simple. And uh, the best way to learn this thing is um, while you're watching the recorded lecture, you can just take the um, whatever I'm writing on the keyboard. You need to type it there and then and save it over there. Uh, I cannot provide all the uh, CPP files, uh, but if there are any, I will provide it. But it's very difficult for you to find which uh, CPP file refers to which lecture. So that's it uh, for this class. So ev everybody should hang up right now, and I uh, will see you inshallah next week.